Once again, thank you all for coming to our event, Sports and Peace Building. And I'd like to invite our Executive Vice President, Tara Sunshine, to introduce <coughs> the event. Thank you. Good morning uh, to all. I must say this is a new experience to be introducing a panel discussion on sports and peace building. Um, but actually there's nothing I would rather be doing this morning except maybe on a tennis court playing doubles. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are going to be many analogies of such today. Uh, for those of you who don't know us as well as others, uh, the Institute of Peace was founded in 1984, and our mission and mandate is really to work on prevention and management, resolution of international conflicts overseas, and to deal with the aftermath and post-conflict stability problems that arise out of the ashes of conflict. And we are congressionally funded, congressionally mandated, and we really work at that intersection between think and do. So we take ideas and intellectual product and we put them through our mental mill and then they go out into the field where conflict is actually taking place. We have offices in Kabul and Baghdad. We work on the Middle East and in Sudan, in Asia, in just about everywhere where the potential for violent conflict or where violent conflict actually exists. So we've been in the field. Um, we have not been on the field as much in terms of this sports and peace building area, but we have done work on some of the major tenets that drive the, in a sense, same concepts about what drives conflict and what are the inherent strategies, tools, and approaches that can reduce levels of violence and that can bring positive outcomes. We recognize that sports, like many fields that we work in, can have positive and negative dimensions to this. Um, there's a lot of positive energy in the sporting arena and there certainly can be um, negative energy. I will tell you that we begin, um, I think, with some healthy skepticism. And that's how we approach all of our new and innovative fields. We have recently expanded our work in gender and youth and security sector. And, and with each step we take, we ask the hard questions. Is this in our lane? Is this an outgrowth of our mission? Can we make a difference? Can this be subjected to hard data and impact and assessment beyond anecdotal evidence? and good feel stories. So we welcome that kind of scrutiny, uh, making sure that we expend energies and resources appropriately to really drive um, what we're looking for, which are innovative solutions and publications and product and leveraging around this. So I'm very glad that we could bring our convening power today to this subject with all of you great experts. Um, it's probably going to be hard to have discussion on such a physical topic when you're stuck in chairs in, um, in this room, but somehow I think we'll manage. So I'm very delighted and honored to turn things over to my colleague, Mike Lexin, and look forward to seeing where this leads us. Thanks so much, and thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Tara, and let me uh, join Tara in welcoming all of you here to the U.S. Institute of Peace for this, um, from us, from our perspective at least, inaugural event. We know many uh, institutions already are looking at sports and peace building, and uh, as Tara said, it's an area we are interested in exploring. Uh, we, we see this meeting this morning and this today as an opportunity for us to become a little more aware of everything that's going on, but we believe everyone here can benefit by having an uh, opportunity to, to hear and exchange views with a lot of uh, real experts in the field coming from a diverse set of backgrounds and experience. 
We will do our best to keep everything on the schedule uh, as indicated. Uh, if it says there's going to be a break, we would intend to have a break. If uh, the discussion is going uh, so d dramatically and dynamically that uh, it goes over in a minute or two, we will try to make that up to you. If everything has been said and everyone has said it, uh, we won't insist on waiting until the last uh, last minute according to the schedule in order to do the break, but we will try to, uh, to keep to the schedule as much as we can. The first panel is going to talk about a historical look at sports and peace building. The organization uh, of how we will structure this is each of the panelists will have approximately 15 minutes uh, to present uh, his points. After that, we'll take a minute or two for the panelists to react to what each other, uh, what each of them has said. And then we do really want to make this a, a dialogue, an interchange. And at that point, uh, I would like to open it up to questions, comments uh, from the floor. Um, we have set up microphones uh, to the left and right of where you're seated at the time uh, that questions, comments, reactions, and so forth from the floor are, are in order, we would ask that those of you interested in participating in that way make your way to the microphone. Uh, if uh, there's more than one person, it will be uh, a line. We'll go back and forth. Uh, should be an opportunity to, and for everyone who wishes to say something, to be able to say it. We hope so, at least. But for the beginning of this, we would like to have uh, the, the speakers able to talk um, without having uh, interruptions in the course of their initial presentations at least. So we will also uh, ask the speakers to go to the podium for the initial part. Uh, our layout here is not quite as dramatic or uh, as, as dramatic, maybe dramatic. It's not quite as uh, user friendly as it, as it could be. Um, when all of you get a chance to join us in our new building uh, sometime next year, you'll see that we have conference facilities which are, uh, which have better lines of sight, if nothing else, and perhaps look a little more architecturally interesting. Uh, our first speaker, uh, who will give us an overview, uh, combines both academic and government experience. It's Dr. Victor Cha, who is the D.S. Song Professor of Government and Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, Dr. Cha is also senior advisor and inaugural holder of the Korea chair at CSIS, so not just academic and government, but also think tank experience. Uh, and he was director of Asian Affairs at the National Security Council um, for the White House. He's the author or co-author of numerous books and articles. Um, he won't be able to be with us the whole day. He's in demand talking about Korea uh, this afternoon, but uh, I'd like to take advantage of uh, having him here for as uh, long as we can. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Shaw to give us an overview of the historical look at sports and peace building. Thank, well, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Mike. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. I'm um, actually a frequent visitor to CSIS for, for completely other reasons having to do with um, uh, East Asia and North Korea. So it's, I'm really happy to be here in this context and to uh, be on such a um, strong panel of experts. I don't really consider myself an expert on this topic. Just because you write a book on it doesn't mean you're an expert on it. Um, I got into this field largely um, almost by accident when I left the, um, uh, the government in 2007 and I came back to Georgetown. Um, in government, I had been working on all the things I had been researching as a scholar, East Asian security, the North Korea problem. Um, I negotiated for, for the U.S. on the six-party talks. So when I returned to government, the last thing I wanted, re returned from government, the last thing I wanted to do was write about this stuff again, because I had been living and breathing it for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, but I did have this one folder in my drawer uh, that was entitled Sports and International Relations. And every time I came across something, I just kept throwing it in the folder. And I thought this was as good a time as any um, to look at this topic. So, um, and it, this was also in the run up to the Beijing Olympics. So I thought sports and politics would be a fantastic topic to write on at this particular time. Um, and that's what I did. Um, <coughs> um, my overview is, is essentially 
a look at how we think about sports and international relations. Um, uh, George Orwell, in 1945, uh, wrote a piece uh, where he described sports as, quote, war minus the shooting, unquote, um, which is typical Orwell. Um, but at the same time, it made a very interesting point about the connections between sports and politics. We play sport. We play it as kids. Our kids play sports every weekend. Uh, we play it as adults. It's a part of our life. It's a part of the life of almost every human being on the face of this planet. International relations is about the study of nation state behavior, but these nation states are composed of individuals um, that interact with one another. So it's astounding, actually, in many ways, that the study of international relations has really, especially the study of international relations in the United States, has really not looked at the link between sports and politics, given the fact that sports plays an important part of almost everybody's livelihood uh, that is involved in, in the world today. This is not the case in Europe. In Europe, there has been more um, studies of the relationship between sports and politics, but not so much in the United States. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is at least talk about a few themes about the way I think we have thought historically about the relationship uh, between um, sports and politics. Um, and I, again, I commend uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace for undertaking this project. I mean, USIP is known very well for um, a number of projects, uh, very cutting edge in terms of the way they look at problems around the world. And so really, I commend you for taking on this, uh, taking on this topic. Um, so one way in which I think um, sports and politics are interlinked is one that's probably pretty obvious to many people. It's it's essentially the implicit assumption of the intellectual inquiry of this today's, today's uh, conference, which is the relationship between sports and peace. Right. Um, uh, the most famous example of this is this concept of the Olympic truce, the notion that when the games begin, when the athletes come together, uh, the assumption is that there is a universal truth. Everybody stops fighting uh, in order to enjoy the games. Uh, the first Olympics uh, was one in which the three kings, and I can't remember when it was, sometime something BC, when the three kings all agreed that there would be a truce that would allow um, individuals from the different kingdoms to walk through the streets of uh, others' territories while the Olympic truce was on, while the festival was going on. Um, and all of us, I think, as we go through these, can think of examples in the way sports and peace or peace building may be interlinked. Um, but this is sort of the original, right? The very first uh, uh, pre-modern Olympic Games uh, brought about this notion of the Olympic truce. The obverse of that is also true, and that is uh, the link between sports and conflict. Um, in many ways, sports can be a prism through which international conflict, political conflict, historical antagonisms get refracted. Um, the, probably the most well-known example of this um, for people of my generation and older, and I may not look old, but I'm ancient, um, was the Cold War. Right? Uh, because during the Cold War, you, uh, all of you remember, the Olympics in many ways was about the competition between the Eastern and the Western blocs. Um, and that victories measured in terms of gold medals or silver medals uh, many, in many ways represented or was supposed to represent the superiority of one system over another. And as we all know, the Eastern Bloc took this to the extreme. Right? Really, you know, initially the Soviets weren't very interested in sports um, and they didn't participate in, in, in the, the Olympics initially. But they made the decision to turn the Olympics into an event in which they would demonstrate the superiority of the socialist system through the superiority of their athletes. Um, and they divided the entire Eastern Bloc in terms of, you know, it was a division of labor. You know, the Romanians were responsible for this. The East Germans were responsible for recruiting. Another group was responsible for medicine, right? So there was all sorts of things that they did to try to make this a, not just a national project, but a, a project that had strong political, uh, had strong political messages attached to it. And that was if, the Soviets and the Eastern Bloc 
did better in terms of won more gold medals, it was a sign about how their system was, uh, was superior. Um, another example of this, I think well known to many people who've studied the Olympics, was in 1956. Um, um, something known as the blood in the water match, which was a water polo match between uh, the, uh, I think it was the semifinals between Soviet Union and Hungary. Uh, this again was 1956, just after the invasion of Hungary, um, and so this was about much more than water polo. Uh, and there were fights that broke out, uh, and it's called the blood in the water match because there were there was fighting among the players in which blood was spilled and the water in the pool turned the pool pink, uh, as well as fighting in the stands. Um, the area that I like to look at um, quite often is Asia. And in Asia, we have lots of examples of this, all of them related to, largely to historical animosity, unrede unredeemed resentments and historical antagonisms that still exist in Asia. Put it, you know, to put it very simply, Whenever there is an important sports match that involves Japan, right, everybody wants to beat Japan, right, because Japan is a former colonizer of the region. Uh, many feel that it hasn't apologized for the past like Germany has. So these matches become real, real grudge matches. Right? And there's a famous example of this in the, um, I think it was the 2004 or 2006 uh, World Cup regionals in which uh, uh, um, uh, China was playing Japan in the um, in the finals of this match, and um, um, the uh, the Japanese uh, coach after the game protested the game because the Chinese players were just playing very physical, right? And the uh, the umpire was not yellow carding or red carding anybody. It was a very very physical match in which they were taking down players, um, and then afterwards. Um, even though the Japanese won, there were protests right outside, uh, protesters who were trying to uh, block Japanese VIP cars from leaving the stadium. Um, well, it turns out that the um, that uh, the Chinese were playing dirty, and the umpires were not really calling anything because the umpires were from North Korea, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. You know, you know, so sports and politics, when it comes to Asia, also is extremely intense and extremely political. And in the book, in my book, I actually talk about why I think it's actually more political in Asia than it is in other parts of the world, but that's not, a, that's not something that we need to talk about um, right now. Um, so a third area in which sports and politics are interlinked um, is in terms of terrorism. Right? Uh, unfortunately, um, sports uh, has been a target of terrorism. Uh, all of us know this today because we hear about the tremendous sums of money that are put into preparing security for the Olympics or for any major sporting event. Um, but this was not always the case. Right? And in many ways, in retrospect, we now understand that sports was really, it, it was and is really an, uh, 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 an ideal target for terrorist activities. Uh, particularly international sporting events where you have athletes that are wearing the colors of their nation that represent the personification of their nation become easy targets for terrorists. Uh, in addition to this, ag again until very recently, sporting venues were very, very what we would call in national security terms, very soft targets for terrorism, you know, basically wide open. And they are highly publicized events. Right? So in many ways, if terrorists want to create terror, if they want to send a message, sporting events become an ideal target for this. And um, I think the, the event that we're most familiar with in terms of this was the 1972 Olympics in Munich. Um, tragic event. Uh, but one that you're probably less familiar with was, uh, again, from, um, from Asia, was in 1987. Right? Because in 1987, uh, a South Korean passenger airliner was blown up as it was flying over the Andaman Sea, um, killing all the passengers on board. And it was blown up by a North Korean terrorist because the North Koreans were basically trying to sabotage South Korea's hosting of the Olympic Games uh, the following year, in September of 1988. Um, and for this reason, we see lots, lots and lots of security now associated with sporting events, uh, precisely because 
um, the, the, the probably the ultimate disaster for sports aficionados and, and, and people who see sport as being apolitical is for it to be used uh, for terrorist um, uh, purposes. Um, a fourth area in which sports and politics are interlinked is in terms of nation building. Um, it's really difficult to separate sports and national identity. Um, uh, the reason many countries or cities covet things like the Olympics or the World Cup is they don't just see these as business ventures. In fact, the history of this up until, the history of the Olympics really up until the LA Games was that sporting events like the Olympics were actually money losers in the end. The cities that hosted them generally ended up doing very poorly financially after them. And it was really not until 1984 when the Olympics were hosted in Los Angeles um, and a, a, a private business model was basically created for the Olympics that these turned into more profitable uh, ventures. But still, um, everybody wants these things because the cachet of being an Olympic city or, uh, or being a World Cup, uh, or a country that hosted the World Cup is irresistible, I think, to many leaders. Um, internally within the politics of each country, uh, uh, politicians, governors, mayors, seek out these big events because it becomes a way to basically try to either obtain federal funding for projects that they may be interested in pursuing or try to speed up government funding of either infrastructure projects or uh, 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 city cleanup projects that they, that they are interested in. So it becomes a very important part of a city's identity and a very important part of a nation's identity. Um, the quintessential example of this uh, is obviously the Beijing Olympics, right? The 2008 Beijing Olympics for, for, for the Chinese were not just a sporting event. Right? This was supposed to be the uh, crowning achievement of uh, basically 30 years of modernization from Deng Xiaoping onwards. Uh, it was supposed to represent China's coming out party, its emergence on the global stage as a major player in world affairs. Um, and, you know, the amount of work that went into building these ultra, super, hyper modern facilities, you know, the water cube, the bird's nest, uh, all of these things, you know, it was really meant to convey an image to the world of here, when you think of China, you think of the water cube, right, and you think of the Great Wall of China, right, modernity and civilization. And they were trying to put everybody in awe, right, of um, of, of China's growth, its rise, plus the fact that it is this ancient civilization. Um, now, we can discuss whether they agreed on accomplishing this task. Um, I think in many ways, um, the Beijing Olympics were very much of a Potemkin village in the sense that they worked so hard to make it perfect. In many ways, it was almost too perfect. And the, and the, and the, the effort at perfection really, re really revealed a lot of the flaws that were associated um, with these games. Um, nevertheless, we can, we can certainly discuss that. Nevertheless, you know, clearly big, what, what in the literature are called mega sporting events, are often very much associated with how a nation defines itself and how it wants to project its image to the world. Um, and, and, and in the Chinese case, not just project an image to the world, but also project an image to its own people, right? The Olympics for China was as much about the legitimacy of the state and the illegitimacy of the Communist Party, right, in the eyes of a younger generation of Chinese who don't see their path to the top as, you know, in the olden days, if you asked, you know, a, a young, bright Chinese student what he wanted to be or what his path to the top would be, it would be join the party, right? Um, now you ask young Chinese what they, you know, they're like, go into business, right? Start an internet company. I mean, they're not, it's not the party anymore. So in many ways, the Olympics for the Chinese was as much about d demonstrating to their own people le the legitimacy of the state and the state's ability to fulfill um, their end of the social contract. Um, okay, I have a two-minute warning, which is perfect. So um, uh, the next and last area, I think, when we talk about sports and politics is the relationship between sports and diplomacy. Right. Um, and here, essentially, the idea is that sporting events or sports have a way 
of creating opportunities for diplomatic breakthroughs uh, when decades of regular diplomacy have been unsuccessful. Okay. The quintessential example of this, often referred to in the literature, is, the, is ping pong diplomacy and Nixon's opening to China. Uh, the idea that um, the, the United States, largely through the invitation of the U.S. ping pong team who had been playing in the world championships in Nagoya, Japan were offered to come to Beijing for some exhibition matches. Uh, these were about the most unlikely diplomats that you could ever imagine. Uh, you know, a Westinghouse executive, a housewife, a hippie from Santa Monica, uh, you know, and, and you know, table tennis in 1972 was not exactly a big sport in the United States. So the U.S. went to these games and just got creamed. I mean, just got completely creamed, uh, but then had the opportunity to go to Beijing um, where the, um, the, the uh, Zhou Enlai, the Prime Minister, met them, uh, and it became what many see as the start of U.S.-China rapprochement and the opening uh, to China. Now, the analytic point I would make here is simply that we often associate sporting events like, like the ping pong diplomacy with big diplomatic breakthroughs. But if you actually research this, the reality is that there have to be these things can be helpful in, in taking you across the goal line, if you will. And there has to be some underlying diplomatic currents or um, underlying forces that are moving in the direction of some sort of diplomatic breakthrough. That is actually when sports can be very helpful. And the reason it can be helpful is it, t it, it, it becomes a high profile event in which politicians and policymakers can determine what the general attitude is among their publics. So in the case of Nixon in China, Nixon had always been interested in opening with China, and there had been a secret dialogue taking place between Kissinger and, and the Chinese, uh, but they had not made this public yet. Uh, this was all happening um, simultaneous with the invitation to the ping pong team. So when the ping pong team went, Time Magazine was there, there's this famous cover. Um, the Amer um, what was it, AT&T registered their first uh, phone call from China when one of the guys on the team wanted to call his mom back home. You know, all this created a lot of positive views in the press and in the public. And what this had the effect of doing is giving the Nixon administration confidence to move forward with this initiative more publicly, um, in many ways also to help them circumvent, you know, the Taiwan lobby that was in the United States that didn't want to see an opening to China. And so this is where diplomatic efforts can be, uh, sporting events can be most effective, when there is some sort of undercurrent. One anecdote I will give you from my um, days in government was um, um, I was once sent um, to North Korea while I was at the White House to negotiate the, the remains of missing American servicemen that had been killed in the Korean War. Um, so um, uh, we negotiated sex successfully the return of six sets of remains. Uh, what nobody told me was that even though I flew Miller into uh, Pyongyang, we were not flying Miller back. So I had these six Pelican cases, uh, m remains, and I was like, how am I gonna bring these back? And the North Koreans said, it's okay, we'll just drive you, right? So they drove me to the DMZ, and drove me through, you know, and then basically we drove through the DMZ to Panmunjom, the joint security area, and we transported the cases across. But the point of this was, this was happening at a time where we were nowhere on six-party talks, right? Not good at all. Um, and in this long drive from Pyongyang through the DMZ, it's about a two and a half hour drive, straight shot, really nothing to look at. They don't turn on the radio. Um, uh, I had to talk to my North Korean counterpart. So he started talking about family and all sorts of other things. And, uh, and I didn't have any of my communication devices because they took those. Um, um, the, uh, uh, so we talked, and then we talked about sports. Right? And um, we talked about the possibility one day of having uh, the North Korean women's soccer team, who are actually very good, they're quite competitive. Um, the evening before, when I turned on the television, the only thing that I could watch, aside from propaganda films of Kim Il-sung, was uh, the North Korean soccer team playing Taiwan. And they beat him like eight nothing or eight two. <laughs> so we talked about the idea of having the women's soccer, because I said, hey, you know, I, go, I teach at Georgetown, Georgetown has a good women's soccer team, and, and uh, we talked about the idea of them touring around and playing some of the NCAA women's teams, just as a sporting event. Of course, it was a nice idea, but at the time there was nothing going on in terms of diplomacy, right? They weren't giving up their nuclear weapons or anything, so it didn't happen. 
Uh, but when things got a little better, like when they signed an agreement to denuclearize and we had inspectors up in Yongbyon in their facilities, an idea came through that wasn't about sports, but it was about music. Right? And as many of you may, may remember, the New York Philharmonic went to Pyongyang um, to play. Um, so that, you know, when you have the right concatenation of forces, uh, both on the diplomatic side and the cultural and sports side, that, those are the chances where you can make, um, uh, make diplomatic breakthroughs. Um, so thank you for listening, and I, um, I, I li uh, look forward to hearing the comments of the others and from you in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, the next speaker will be Eric Deans. Uh, he's liaison officer at the United Nations Office on Sport for Development and Peace in New York. He previously uh, worked at UNESCO. He will provide a UN perspective or a perspective from the UN on the issue we're talking about today, sports and peace building. Eric. Um, first of all, thank you very much, um, uh, United States Institute of Peace, for the invitation um, and the opportunity to speak at this very important and interesting event. Um, I would like to begin with um, a short uh, five-minute video clip that um, kind of portrays what the UN and our office is doing in the field. And then it will give you a very brief um, description of the tasks of our office. Um, and make a distinction between um, the different approaches um, of peace building um, through sport, which I would call the, the macro and the micro approach to peace building through sport. And um, then if I have time, I would like to give some examples, some concrete examples of the UN activities in that field and um, um, make some uh, one or two important points, what is missing um, uh, in, our, in our activities, in our field. And uh, yes, so I would like to show you that video clip. New York, 2003, during the General Assembly of the United Nations, a resolution on sport is submitted. The resolution is entitled, Sport as a Means to Promote Education, Health, Development, and peace. On November the 3rd, 2003, the resolution is adopted. Volunteers strive to implement the resolution on sport in some of the most dramatic situations. They've lost their friends, they've lost their relatives, so they will come here, they will make friends. I think training is what will help them to improve their mental you know, health. So in this place they will learn some things about life and how they can overcome their sorrow, how they can help each other. So I think, yes yeah, sure, it has a very good social role. A lot of successful projects have been set up in refugee camps, for instance. Sport helps me a lot. Basketball makes me healthier and I have fun playing. That's what I believe. I don't know what the future holds for me. But I think I need to be ready for anything, for any situation. That's why I'm trying my best to become a good basketball player and to be an educated person, for my future. There are children here who every time you talk to them, they talked about war. And when they played games, they played with make-believe guns. They played at being soldiers. But when we introduced them to communication games, group games, little by little these same children tried to forget about playing guns and soldiers, and now they know that there are other games, peaceful games, games about living together. 
That's the kind of change in behavior I've seen here, thanks to sport. When communication breaks down between communities, sometimes the one place they can still meet is on the football field. We don't know each other, but if we play a soccer match, our relation automatically will be different after playing one hour together. We learn to, to communicate each other without talking. So it's a way to communicate to, with the people and to have a different relation. This is a good example uh, how Sport can bring people together. Sports unites them and brings people, communities from different countries, different nationalities, different tribes, religions together. Sport as a means to promoting development and peace can help to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. Sport is a language every one of us can speak. When we do, we can bridge social, economic, religious, and cultural divides. We can help improve the well-being of individuals and communities. We can inspire hope in ourselves and others. At the World Summit in 2005, all the world's governments declared that sport can foster peace and development and can contribute to an atmosphere of tolerance and understanding. That is why the United Nations is using sport as a cost-effective tool to reach the Millennium Development Goals, the common vision adopted by all countries for a better world. And it is why the United Nations is turning to sport to support people recovering from armed conflict, especially young people. Let us mobilize the power of sport in our quest for peace and development around the world. Thank you. So, as I already said, I would like to give you a very quick um, description of our office. Um, the UN Office on Sport for Development and Peace was established in 2001 um, with the appointment of the first special advisor to the SG on Sport for Development and Peace. Um, in 2008, the second uh, special advisor was um, appointed. So it's a, a fairly new um, addition to, um, to the UN Secretariat. And our office... Um, um, is supporting the, the mandate of the special advisor. Um, he has a threefold mandate, which is facilitator, advocate, and representative. Um, advocacy uh, is a very important um, um, field that we're involved in. We're trying to um, kind of um, convince, uh, first of all, governments to mainstream sports in, into their uh, development uh, plans and priorities and uh, internationally and national development plans. And also we, within the UN system, we're trying to um, keep sport on the agenda. Many UN um, agencies, funds, and programs are using sports for development peace uh, since many years, and we're trying to keep it on the agenda. Um, facilitation um, means that we are facilitating contacts uh, within the UN system and, and beyond. Um, we are providing advice on, on best practices and um, bring actors together. Sometimes we also are, in, are engaged in fundraising, but on a very modest level. And um, third, uh, representative, the special advisor represents the, uh, the um, UN system and the SG, the Secretary General, at important um, mega sports events. So um, we have a very uh, small office. We have seven staff members. Um, and are financed uh, through uh, voluntary contributions by member states. Um, we have a trust fund. Uh, so it's basically member states uh, that, um, that um, uh, finance our activities. Um, we also host the um, International um, Working Group on Sport Development and Peace, which is an intergovernmental um, body um, that, um, that develops policy recommendations for governments. Governments sit together, um, together and work together with experts and observers to 
to develop concrete recommendations how to use sport in development um, um, plans and, and programs on the country level. So, and in this working group, international working group, we also, we also have a, a sub-thematic working group on sport for peace, <coughs> but we still have to, we still have to find funding uh, to, to launch this um, working group. We already started with uh, different others, uh, different other working groups, such as sport, uh, sport for youth and child development, but um, there has to be one or two member states who take the lead um, in facilitating that, um, that um, working group. Um, I would like to, to introduce um, an, a distinction between um, several approaches um, um, of sport um, um, for peace building. And Dr. Cha already mentioned the, the first dimension, the first um, approach, which I would call the, the macro approach. It's the realm of um, bilateral um, relations of um, the Olympic truce, that very old and idealistic concept um, revived by the International Olympic Committee and at the UN. We have the biannual General Assembly resolutions that are adopted unanimously by all member states that really um, request uh, the member states to, to respect and observe the Olympic <coughs> truce. So this realm is, is a very political one and um, uh, full of symbols and um, using uh, mega sports events and encounters on, on, a, on an elite level to, to promote friendship and uh, good relations between nations and their societies. Um, there's also the, um, what, I would, what I would call the micro approach to peace building through sport, and this is um, taking place on a, on a grassroots level, uh, using programs. Um, and um, really building on um, the so-called intrinsic values, benefits, social norms of sport, which everybody of us um, uh, might know. It's about uh, fair play, about team spirit, about promoting uh, self-confidence, resilience, um, and so, so on. So the UN is, um, the bulk of the UN activities um, uh, is uh, taking place in that realm of, of, of that micro approach. This has to do with the, with the mandate of the UN and its programs, funds, and specialized agencies who are really country-driven and program-driven. And also because, um, due to the fact that there is a, a general shift of, con of conflict after the Cold War, uh, moving from international conflict to intrastate conflict. And here the UN has a special um, role to play in, um, in resolving c conflict on a very um, grassroots level, on a very community level. Um, so, one important point I wanted to make is um, that we need to move away from, from, from these anecdotes that exist um, in, in both uh, realms, within both approaches. Um, you have the negative and the positive um, anecdotes, um, Dr. Cha already referred to them, um, but this does not bring us or the movement forward. We really need to move away from these anecdotes and promote evidence-based research. And um, also kind of um, develop a knowledge base uh, to collect best, uh, not best practice, but good practices. I wouldn't go so far to call them best practices. Good practice that inspire um, program developers and program coordinators on the ground to develop um, specific programs that are adapted to the local needs and realities of, of, of the communities and the countries we work in. Um, because very often, um, Sport for Development Peace uses a, um, um, a franchised approach uh, to, to, um, for development and peace building programs. But it's important that we really um, go away from that and really adapt our programs to, um, to the local culture. Um, Another point I wanted to stress is um, what might be imp uh, quite interesting to you, um, that within that um, micro approach that I just um, uh, talked about, um, the UN and especially the UN peacekeeping operations are using um, sport in, in, in t with two strategies. The one is um, sport and sports events that attract a, uh, a crowd, an audience many people to use it as a platform, as a medium to disseminate um, peace messages. Uh, messages to promote a culture of peace, to foster a non-violent atmosphere, 
especially in uh, pre-election phases uh, in, in the countries. Um, so it's actually like a, me uh, like a communication tool um, to really um, multiply messages. And uh, the second one is uh, a more programmatic one that really um, has uh, pedagogical and programmatic um, goals such as uh, to reconcile um, um, kind of former opponents, communities, to reintegrate child soldiers, and this is a field that um, Dean will um, talk about later, I think. Um, and also, within peacekeeping operations, we, um, we now, since a couple of years, we have a, a special role played by the armed forces of, of peacekeeping operations that um, are very useful in refurbishing or constructing sports facilities uh, for local communities. Um, and um, some years ago, um, the troops had their own sports facilities to promote the health of their troops. But um, now there is also a shift from um, this very specific security uh, mandates of, of troops uh, towards more develop developmental activities. And this has also the, the, the positive effect that um, uh, <coughs> peacekeeping operations are more welcome um, by, by their host communities and to improve relations with them to work really uh, well together. And um, for example, yeah, a couple of examples would be um, from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. Uh, the peacekeeping operation there um, organized uh, football matches that brought together um, um, the rebel troops together with the government forces troops. Uh, there was a peace agreement already in place, so um, this is the basis for all these activities of the UN in, in, in post-conflict countries. Um, but it was really interesting to see how, um, how re reunited for 90 minutes or longer um, kind of former opponents, even on, in the military wing, um, can, can be um, through sport. Uh, in Haiti, I just came back from Haiti um, uh, um, a couple of days ago. In Port-au-Prince, the uh, UN peacekeeping, UN stabilization mission, um, MINUSTA, um, works together with um, um, youth gangs and introduces sport, um, futsal, in indoor football, um, capoeira, and dance to prevent youth from joining or, yeah, let's say they, they try to dismantle gangs uh, through uh, community activities and sport and also prevent youth from joining them. It was very interesting to see um, how around sports events, um, the, the mission together with a Brazilian NGO called Viva Rio has uh, every year a peace accords between violent gangs um, to, to really resolve conflict in, in, a, in a peaceful way. So these are a couple of, um, of examples um, um, that um, the UN is undertaking in, in on the grassroots level. And with that, um, I think we're already behind in time. I would like to, to have more time for an interactive discussion. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, our third speaker is uh, Dean Ravitsa. Dr. Ravitsa is an assistant professor in the Department of Health and Sports Sciences at Salisbury University. He's been the principal investigator for a long-term research project on the use of sport for children and youth in armed conflict settings, um, especially focused on northern Uganda. Primary focus of his work overall is the role of sport in the reintegration of former child combatants, a topic that's already <laughs> been mentioned a couple times. It's an important specific area of interest in the nexus between sports, conflict, and peace building. So, Dr. Ravitsa, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, first of all. Um, I'm very pleased to be here at USIP. I've been here a few times for several different events, and um, I've always been enriched by the work of USIP and come away from here um, even that much more knowledgeable. So, um, I hope that's the same for you today as well. Um, uh, thank you to everyone, though, for putting this together and, and what I think is in, uh, an important aspect of peace building and, uh, through sport. So um, I hope to be able to provide you with some insights into uh, the work that I've been doing um, for the past about half decade now 
in, in specifically in northern Uganda. After laugh, though, it's just about time, just about five minutes ago, I would have started a lecture at the university. And um, believe me, I'm very happy that you're all a lot more spryer than my 10 a.m. class. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, go through this and, and hit on some points. It's hard to put into 15 minutes five years' worth of um, work and, of course, about 200 pages of data. Um, just quantitative at this point, but um, I'm going to uh, try and give you an overall view and, uh, and of course, open for many questions. I'll be here all day, so um, uh, I hope I'll be able to provide you with some more answers. But um, I, I, I have a, uh, quite a long history in Africa. Um, when I was younger, and I'm not ancient, <laughs> but um, uh, I lived in... <laughs> Nobody here is. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, um, I, I lived in I, I lived in East Africa in Tanzania, and um, about that time was when the genocide in Rwanda began in 1994. And at that time, a friend of mine, whom we played badminton with on Monday nights, um, was the director of UNICEF, uh, the country director at that time, and had solicited people to to really go and and to help out because people didn't really know what was going on, and even you were in a neighboring country, you didn't know what was going on. And um, when I asked her what I could do at that time, you know, she said, "Do what you do best, sport." And I was like, you know. Um, I didn't think I had really any type of um, uh, credentials to do anything. Um, but uh, we went to some of the refugee camps, and we did. We, we engaged the children and youth in the refugee camps who were you know, faced with this idea of genocide in their country and um, did our best to provide activities for them and to, to bring about some type of normalcy to it. Um, did it work? I don't know. And, um, but um, it did instill in me um, this idea of sport and peace and peace building and, and, and vulnerable children, and um, which is extended into northern Uganda. Um, in, in June 2005, I visited northern Uganda, which at the time was in the midst of a 20-year conflict. Um, as I sat under a tree at the Gusco Interim Care Center for former abductees of the Lord's Resistance Army, I listened intently as young boys and girls told their stories of abduction, rape, deprivation, brutality, and violence. Uh, they continued to share their concerns for their future and the anxiety they experienced over returning to their communities. At the request of the center director, the staff and I developed sport activities in which the children engaged each late afternoon. Um, this sport component took place just outside of the center in an open field adjacent to a local secondary school, the only time the children left the confines of the center for programming purposes. During the first evening of play, a young boy leaving, uh, uh, leaving the nearby school slowly walked through the middle of the football match. And I called out to him just to make sure, you know, just to ensure his safety and that he noticed the space in which we were playing. And he turned to me and he said, Mzungu, which loosely translates to white men, um, uh, why, uh, why do you waste your time with these rebels? He asked me and proceeded to walk away from the area. Uh, I spoke to the children at the center about this incident and asked them their feelings towards such a remark. They stated their displeasure, explaining how they were all randomly forced into child soldiering and perpetrated violence under a kill-or-be-killed state. Their public reactions to such, uh, such cases of community stigma play an integral role in their successful reintegration. Approximately two weeks later, however, the same boy returned to our playing area and requested to me, Mzungu, can I play? Noting the children's organizational skills, they were, these uh, uh, former combatants were empowered to organize their own activities at that point, uh, um, their focus and uh, methods of fair play. The boy joined in, as did ultimately other children in youth, setting forth my research with the role of sport in the reintegration of former child soldiers. Um, but uh, now, conflicts continue to dramatically alter the lives of children around the world. Over the last decade, hundreds of thousands of children have engaged in various conflicts in different capacities. Forcible abductions continue to occur in a number of countries, thrusting children into combat. Large numbers of children volunteer to arm groups, uh, for armed groups, excuse me, under the duress of collapsed educational and ac economical infrastructures or after witnessing violence against immediately immediate family or community members. The experience of being a child soldier has particularly devastating consequences according to gender. 
Whether by way of forced abduction or recruitment, conflicts put children at risk both physically and psychosocially. The family and community response former child soldiers uh, uh, receive upon return can vary dramatically. Some return with physical disabilities as a result of landmines and amputations, thus facing further community stigma. The, the reintroduction of former child soldiers back in the, in the community is a complex process that can often be unsuccessful. The context of this field work and research is northern Uganda, a region slowly emerging from one of Africa's longest running conflicts. Throughout the approximately 23 years of conflict where upwards of 60,000 children and youth were abducted and forced to take on various roles within the LRA, including that of perpetrators of horrific violence against members of their community. Girls were, often, uh, girls were often victims of sexual abuse and rape, at times bearing children in the bush. Additionally, the complex nature of this conflict forced hundreds of thousands of people into internally displaced persons camps that yielded threats to personal safety and little opportunity for education and income generating activities. And tens of thousands of children known as night commuters, desperate to avoid abduction, walked for miles to town center seeking protection producing an even more complex emergency. Sport interventions have been and remain a part of the demobilization, de disarmament, and reintegration programs, focusing mainly on the reintegration aspect. Returnees engage in sport activities at interim care centers, as I described earlier, while awaiting return to their families and communities. The use of sport draws former combatants out of violent routines to the participation in a paradigm that is bound by socially acceptable behaviors. Current programs aimed at the reintegration process include the use of sociomotricity principles within the school setting for former child soldiers in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This program involves the use of elementary games focused on teamwork and self-control, adventure-based activities aimed at building empathetic dynamics within the group setting, and team sports. Football programs were also introduced to former child, ampu child soldier amputees in Liberia, and former child soldiers associated with the LTTE in Sri Lanka participate in cricket programs along other marginalized children aimed at leadership skills and helping children appreciate the values of trust, respect, fair play, and fair play off the cricket field. Um, these are just a number of pro, these are just some examples, and I certainly don't endorse any of the programs. Um, I, 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 I've been able to, you know, see some of the programs and stuff, some of the literature and things like that and talk with people, but um, uh, uh, certainly I'm always um, uh, pleased to see and uh, programs that are going on and, and seek to really try to investigate those programs and look at which, um, uh, what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it. During the beginning observational phase of our research, interviews with key stakeholders in the reintegration process yielded only vague responses to questions addressing the use of sport for former abductees seeking reintegration. Their responses mainly focused on the immediate effects of sport, stating it had a calming effect on former abductees, allowing them to sleep better at night, um, forgetting the past, and showing decreased aggression towards others. Yet no scientific studies have yielded data to, to support these immediate effects of sport on returnees. Equally scarce is any data on the immediate and holistic effects of sport more aptly garnered from longer term engagement in community based programs. That is the use of sport as an educational and more acutely therapeutic tool, ultimately leading to peaceful reintegration within the cultural context. There is a need for more holistic community based programs that include sport that are bound to the philosophical underpinnings of peaceful play within conflict affected regions, especially for children and youth who lack the opportunity to attend school and benefit from the sport programming that schools have to offer. Um, just off script, um, one of the findings that we found that the largest, uh, uh, the, the venue in which children and youth were participating in sport was in school. Um, upwards of 85, 86 percent of the children were participating in sport within the school. So um, the, the, there's a bit of complexity there, though, in the sense that, uh, and, and I'll talk, mention it briefly, but uh, many former child soldiers don't have the opportunity to return to school. 
So therefore, they lack the, the uh, opportunities to gain the benefits from sport if that is the, indeed the main venue, as we discovered. Um, by utilizing sport as a means for social development, young people from antagonistic population groups meet and communicate in a neutral space or on common ground, as we've discussed earlier, to the end of inciting a process of peace and social cohesion on a very public stage of sport. Our recent findings have also shown that male and female former abductees agreed that participation in sport was a significant factor in their acceptance by peers within their communities. Former abductees found sport to be a means to reconnect them to the lives they experienced prior to their abduction by reestablishing a positive identity. And non-abducted children and youth had a positive attitude towards engaging in sport with former abductees. Such is the case for young Samuel, a 15-year-old former abductee whose brief story I'll share with you. Um, Samuel was abducted by the LRA at age 12 for a period of 18 months. He faced heinous levels of exposures to violence, ultimately having his left arm hacked off by the rebels, leaving him for dead in the bush. After being found by the government forces and taken to an intern care center, Samuel reunited with members of his immediate family and was able to return to school. His athletic prowess, despite his physical disability, coupled with his strong leadership skills, I might say developed while in the bush, earned him the peer elected title of sport prefect at a school. While this seems like a successful case of reintegration, Samuel reported to us he was still viewed negatively by members of his village. While sport addressed one outcome of reintegration, at this point in time it failed to alleviate the stigma he experienced within his community. Despite the potential for sport as an agent for peace and social change, sport is also a potential forum for participants to unleash violent behaviors. Given that the former abductees were often viewed as overly aggressive individuals with violent tendencies within their communities, we found that non-abductees were more likely to solve conflicts in sport by way of peaceful responses than their formerly abducted counterparts who engaged in more violent responses. These resp the violent responses included instances of arguing, fighting, and retaliation, while peaceful responses to conflicts that arose during engagement in sport activities included discussions, seeking outside help, and referring to existing rules. We, we have to be careful with these findings, though, because we really do need to understand more of the cultural context and the operant systems in which the children in, uh, navigate within their lives, and we have to dig deeper for that. While that was a quantitative finding, we need to follow that up with more qualitative research in order to really dig deeper to know and understand um, why these responses were coming about. <coughs> Whether sport facilitates the reintegration of former child soldiers depends upon its, its implementation. For sport to contribute to healthy social development and reintegration, programs must capitalize on the inherent qualities of sport, such as fair play, teamwork, and fostering a supportive environment, utilize disputes as teachable moments, adopt culturally relevant strategies for resolving conflict and building trust, and provide strategies for the transfer of these programmatic objectives to other pertinent aspects of children's lives. Longitudinal research on the reintegration of former child soldiers continues to emerge as countries transition from conflict to peace and stability. Similar research on the role of sport and the reintegration of former child soldiers remains sparse. Therefore, we must continue to adopt research strategies that provide more evidence, more of an evidence base about the long-term of effects of sport experiences in the reintegration of former combatants in order to develop and test locally relevant and feasible interventions to avoid, as we stated early, just mere anecdotal evidence. The continuation of this research in northern Uganda challenges us as to whether we can provide positive outcomes of sport and reintegration amidst one of the most complex conflicts in the world and to add to the limited body of support for children in a body of knowledge, excuse me, of support for children in armed conflict through sport. If positive outcomes can occur in a place as challenging as northern Uganda, that would boost confidence that the findings and implications may have a positive effect for other young survivors of war. Thank you. Thanks. 
Well, again, thanks to um, all three panelists. Um, what I would propose now is give each of them a chance, uh, if he wishes, to comment on uh, remarks of the other two, and then we will get into the more interactive part uh, with um, as many of you as possible participating in this exchange. So, um, Dr. Cha, do you have any thoughts that you're inspired to add? Um. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed the, both um, Eric and Dean's uh, presentations. I don't know how much more I could add to that. Um, um, you know, I think, I mean, I think what it shows is that the, there are, there's sort of, um, there are micro and macro ways to look at this issue. Uh, one is a very, very much of a grassroots uh, effort that uh, works with individuals. Um, um, what resonates with me is sort of the idea of using disputes and sporting events as teachable moments um, for um, individuals that may have not had any of that sort of um, experience in the past at all that took everything in confrontational terms. I mean, that's, and, and I think many of the practitioners who work on this area are working very much at the micro level. Um, and then there's the macro level, which looks at the way um, um, Sporting events historically have played a role in either creating diplomatic, uh, uh, I shouldn't say creating, helping to facilitate uh, diplomatic breakthroughs um, uh, between governments. And so I think there are two very different um, lenses on this, although both of them I think are useful. Thank you. Eric, any additional thoughts, comments? Um, I think we all touched upon um, the uh, need for research. Uh, is very important. Um, I've been talking to to other uh, development um, practitioners, and they were kind of surprised to to hear about our um, very frequent um, uh, point that we make in the sport for development and peace community that we need research. I think it's also because we are struggling to be um, to convince others, and I think research, especially to convince donors um, to uh, to give funds is very important. Um, they need the evidence-based research to, um, to really uh, release the funds. And um, we still deal with uh, many um, people who are c kind of skeptical towards the, that, um, that whole movement, um, despite the, the many success stories and positive anecdotal evidence. So um, we really have to, to, to step up um, scientific research on that. That's the point I would like to make, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, we're going to see how far we'll go on that with uh, the third panel this afternoon, which is called Evaluation Scoring Peace Building Through Sports. I suspect there will be a, a lively exchange. And uh, Dean, any thoughts from um, the other? No, I think yeah. kind of being a bit of an oddball at times, um, I know within my field, um, a lot of individuals ask me, um, you know, and, and I explained kind of how this came about and stuff, and it was during a postdoctoral year in northern Uganda, uh, well, in, in Uganda and stuff, but um, um, by, like I said, by no means we have to be very careful that we also don't, you know, you know what I do is not an absolute, and um, uh, really trying to look at things within that cultural context. And it may not transfer, but hopefully that there will be some transference. And I think that's also in terms of the program and programmatic interventions. What, uh, and I'm sure that we're gonna hear a lot about that and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, um, well, I'm looking forward to everything. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and, uh, but um, uh, I, I think that we have to be very careful about that. Um, you know, the round peg and square hole and, and, and such that, you know, what works here, oh, that's gonna work here. And, and um, I know I've been asked to, you know, to come to different countries and uh, with children and youth in armed conflict. And, um, I, you know, I, I've kind of stayed away from that right now. And, and I, I want to do this right. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the way I kind of look at it. And, and I have mounds of data, and, and, and I'm writing. I, I am, so you'll, you'll get things. And so, but um, um, I, I think that's really, really important is to keep an eye on that. And, and there are a lot of complexity, layers of complexities that go along with it. And I'm sure that we're gonna hear some of those also, some of those will come out in terms of the programming and as Eric says with the, um, 
uh, 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 with the donors and, and, and just, ju just all those layers of complexity that hopefully that we can cut through to be able to provide really, you know, you know just a strong evidence base of what it is that we do. Um, I think that's very important. Um, I, I, I liked, uh, I w it was interesting that Dr. Cha mentioned about um, uh, the sport and, and, and terrorism. And um, as I sat in Uganda this summer, and of course when the World Cup final was going off and I was at the rugby field just a couple of days before that for a Uganda-Kenya <coughs> rugby match, and, um, and only to find out you know, a couple of days later that um, it had been bombed by, um, of course, what is you know, the bombings that went off. And, and, and a friend of mine said, wow, what a pity to use sport to disseminate terror. And um, it just happened that it was known that it would be a very large gathering. And, um, and, and one of my research assistants was there, and thank goodness he, and, and always kind of deadpan and somewhat jokingly said, well, I noticed when I had blood on me, it wasn't mine, so I kept moving. And, and I was like, okay, I'm glad you can uh, joke about it. But um, uh, that, that whole idea of disseminating terror through sport really hit home there. For me, as uh, as I was right at that field just a couple of days before for that match, and and to see that, so um, uh, I, I certainly would, uh, and I'm going to try and corral him before he goes to talk more about that and stuff. So, but thank you all very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope we've got uh, some lively and engaged people here. The uh, the comment was that, you know, what do your students do at 10 o'clock? Do they sit there and Sit there I'm about tweet. waking them yeah. up right now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, no. But uh, if you, th those who are interested in uh, making a comment, asking a question, if I could encourage you to move to the microphones, I see our own David Smith is. Uh, Thank you. Um, is this, uh, oh, I'm sure this is. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, I, what I would uh, don't wait for David to finish. If you want to talk, uh, yeah, please, please head to the nearest microphone and get in the queue. And uh, I would like if uh, you could identify yourself. Um, when you make your comment. If you want to, uh, add questions are fine. If someone wants to make a comment, that's fine. If someone wants to make a speech, we may arrange for that to be done during the break. <laughs> no speech. Uh, David Smith from USIP. Um, two comments, one on the macro context and one of kind of the micro context, or maybe it's a question. Dr. Cha was mentioning um, the risks, and one of the things that I rem reminded myself of my own generation was really the boycott of the Olympics in 1980 by the United States as using sports is kind of high pol politics kind of operationally. And the other is the recent Commonwealth Games in India as being an example of the risk of putting yourself out there and India being shown for all of its warts and not succeeding maybe the way China believes they succeeded if you had any thoughts on particularly the Commonwealth Games. And then looking at the micro and what Dean was saying is what you're speaking to is the risks and things gone bad in a sense of when this doesn't work. And, and how it's important to, uh, to, to not script it out. Maybe you can't script it out. But you know, how do we avoid a sporting event? You know, we, we think about sporting events. Often we think about you know, uh, football games in Europe going, you know, going wild, you know, where it gets to be too much of a rivalry. And then there's really blood beyond the field itself. How do you avoid that from happening? So kind of a two-pronged two inquiry here. Thanks. You want to start? Yeah, okay. um, um, please. The, um, uh, those are I mean, two very interesting questions on the boycotts. I mean, it is it's true. I mean, the way, the way sport, um, sport was used uh, during the Olympics um, and became more and more political, and the irony was ultimately became so political that the, the final decision was not to play, right, right? Uh, both in 1980 and then, uh, and then in 1984. And you know what we what I didn't refer to. There is a body of literature that is strongly against the whole idea of sports and politics. That really says um, it's what I call sort of the sports purist view, uh, where we should see sport only as sport and and nothing else. Um, and of course, a lot of people who believe that really that really start to come out after 1980 and and 1984. The um, um, the um, so that, that that's one point on the on the point about um, the Indian Commonwealth Games. Absolutely, I mean, the 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 flip side of nation building using sport for nation building is that sometimes it can go terribly wrong. Um, and in the Indian case, it did. In the Commonwealth Games, you saw all the flaws. 
Uh, I mean, quite frankly, no offense to anyone here, but the Atlanta games were also seen that way. The Atlanta Olympics were not seen as the most terribly well-organized games. That's why often when countries host these Olympics, they, you know, I'll, I'll, they put an incredible amount into the logistics of preparing for these games. Um, when you compare the Atlanta games with the Sydney games, um, you know, Australia has been very successful at taking sports and really projecting their image in the world on a broader, you know, really on a broader uh, scale than they are in terms of power capabilities terms. You know, they're at best a middle power, and yet uh, they have used sporting <coughs> events to really give themselves a broader space. I mean, everybody watches them. Everybody watches the Sydney Games. They think of Australia, you know, a, a, a democracy, a big player in the global war on terror. It just expands their overall uh, image. The, the one famous example, I think, that of it going bad was Mugabe. Right, who uh, wanted to uh, use uh, a, um, a regional um, sporting event as basically a springboard to be, be to putting in a bid eventually to be the first African nation to host the Olympics. Um, and of course, everything went wrong in terms of the preparation for this uh, to the point where the loudspeaker system didn't work. Uh, they gave the wrong date for the venue. Everything just everything went wrong, and uh, and in that case, you know, it obviously nation building, you know, the intention is 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 nation building and creating, a, a projecting a national identity that just goes horribly wrong. So, thanks. Um, you know, it, it, in the context which I'm working, first of all, it, it's very important not to really try to put labels on these children and youth. Um, many of them are you know, very, you know, just emerging from conflict and, and, and various roles in conflict and, and um, they're, they're just very happy to be alive but m have more stress over um, their, their futures than it is what they did in the past. Um, we, I've been very lucky to be able to, you know, to not really experience much, if, if any, violence outside of maybe just some immediate um, reactions. Um, what we were looking at were um, what we called the levels of conflict in sport and um, strategies for resolution. And we looked at it really within the cultural context. Um, again, like I said, that um, strategies that work in one <coughs> area may not work in another. Um, they may not be culturally relevant. Um, when, uh, when we looked at that, we looked at just simple disagreements in sport all the way through you know, that full-blown retaliation and, and, and marking someone for harm. And, and how do we go about that? Um, we haven't really experienced um, any of the latter, uh, as more opposed to the uh, as more opposed to the um, the former. There, just regular disputes that you can find on any playground. I remember in Tanzania, a group of children that were playing cricket spent more time arguing than they did actually playing. And finally, I gave them a rule book <laughs> and, and and told them to memorize it. <laughs> um, uh, to avoid the, uh, uh, that arguing. Um, but, uh, you know, again, sport is very public, and, and, and in, in, in many of the, and through school, um, they're participating in, a, in sport more so than they are in larger community um, events and things that, um, you know, that may spawn some of that, I don't know, uh, hooliganism, if you will. Or, or, or uh, violent tendencies of even spectators and stuff, let alone um, individuals participating. Um, but uh, we, we, we've seen more or less uh, just at that lower level of things where there's arguments and, 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 and um, some physical reactions and stuff to sport. And again, we, we want to utilize these strategies and um, for them to be able to understand that that's not really uh, an acceptable behavior, and but also connect it once again to outside of the um, uh, of the football field um, or, or or sport uh, sporting events. Um, uh, you know that's one of the things that I think is really important, as I said before, is that transfer. And and you know how you know what good is it if it's done in sport but not transferred anywhere anywhere else. And um, that's just containing it in that one paradigm. And um, so, so we do want to adopt those strategies and, um, and have culturally relevant <coughs> strategies that would be able, to, uh, be able to prevent that, but even a step 
before that is 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 um, being able to uh, prevent it from happening in the first place, and uh, and, um, and but having be you know being prepared to react to such incidences. So um, I'm not sure if I answered the question there, but um, I tried to in a roundabout way try to explain that. Okay, thanks, um, Ted. Ted Pfeiffer, uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. We've heard the panelists discuss various paradigms, ways of looking at sports. Sports as a looking at sports and peacemaking from a macro or micro perspective. Sports as an essentially wholesome, positive activity, but which is something we have to look at um, and evaluate better to decide whether it's just a good activity or it's a useful activity. But the more and more the panelists have discussed it, it's also a activity which has a moral or a value-free basis. It's an activity. You can look at it as an activity without regard to having a positive or a negative value in of itself. Politically, culturally, you could uh, approach it as a tool. And perhaps from an analytical perspective, it can be looked at in that way as well. And that can be just yet another paradigm for thinking about sports and peace building, or sports. Was that a? Okay. Just comment. Okay. <laughs> Someone want to take that one on? No, I, I, I well, I'm not going to take it on too much, but um, I would definitely agree. I was talking about this not too long ago about being, you know, a, a type of very neutral, and uh, and it is what you put into it, and what is, uh, you know, what you make of it, and um, uh, how you respond to, th uh, um, how how you respond to. You know any incidences that may occur, or again at that macro level, I'll let Dr. Cha um, mention that, uh, uh, talk about that. But also, I wanted to mention something about um, uh, you know also we don't uh, we tend to look a lot at team sport, and uh, maybe not so much at individual sport as well. And we have to look at that idea. And now I, I mentioned that also because of. Um, uh, um, looking at, we found that um, a lot of individuals participated in, in athletics, which technically is a team sport because you're helping out the team in terms of an overall score, but it's an individual performance, not um, uh, outside of relays, excuse me. Um, uh, that, that really is dependent upon that individual and, and the individual effort that's there as well. So um, we need to be able to, um, you know, differentiate between that and, and, and look with you know, at all different aspects of sport, not just, we tend to be very team sport slanted, I think. And, and there's many values that are there that are intrinsic um, that we can bring to um, the table with utilizing sport in a team sense, but also looking at other, um, uh, uh, other forms of sport that may not be, you know, always so common. Okay. Um, <coughs> I, I think and Ted's comment is a, it's a very interesting one, and I would, I think, as, as Dean said, I think at the micro level that it is value-free in that sense, um, that people are on the field and they play the game for what it is. Um, in a broader social setting, sports in many ways in our everyday lives, is a, it's a great social equalizer um, in the sense that, you know, I'm originally from New York City, and uh, you take the train in the morning the day after the Yankees <coughs> win, and everybody's talking to each other in a way that they would never talk to each other. Um, um, or when the Giants won last night. So the same sort of thing. <coughs> but I think at a macro level, though, at a macro level, um, sports, um, sports and the sort of mega sporting events do implicitly suggest and carry um, a value message. And in the sense that <coughs> sports, um, whether you're talking about the Olympics, or, I mean, it is about merit, right? It is about the best performance should win with fair rules. Everybody plays on a level playing field, fair rules, transparent rules, a referee, and then the best athlete wins. Um, and 
when you import some of those ideas and they're packaged in the form of Olympics or other mega sporting events and they're taking to illiberal societies, it does create problems sometimes. Uh, because, and, and this is something the Olympic organizers and the IOC charter read, readily acknowledges that sport in many ways reflects classical liberal, liberalist values. Um, and that there is a link between sport and human rights and sport and human dignity, uh, sport and meritocracy, um, and sport and equal opportunity. Um, and so I think in that sense, um, at the macro level, it does sometimes carry uh, political values that um, some, um, um, you know, it's ironic because some illiberal regimes like China, in those sorts of instances, they try to use the sports purist argument. They say, oh, sport, it's just about sport, it's about nothing else, and it should not have anything to say about our political values and our system. Um, um, so they sort of then flip the table and try to use the sports purism argument. Uh, but I think at that macro level, it does, it does have those sorts of uh, connotations. You know, the greatest example of this was the Nazi games, right, where, uh, you know, Hitler really tried to use these games to show the superior, the supremacy of the Aryan race, and then this African-American man wins all of these gold medals. Um, uh, and that was, you know, never intended to be a political message, but it clearly was the quintessential political message. So. Okay, thanks. Um, over here. Uh, Mike O'Malley, I'm a student in history class. And Dr. Reese, I had a question for you, if you could. You mentioned uh, child soldier, former child soldiers in Uganda and sports as a vehicle for education and reintegration, and then went on to state that the reform of abductions had exhibited more aggressive behavior than the former abductees who tend no. to be more peaceful. No, the, the non abductees oh, no, and former abductees. Thank you. Okay. My question then is. You mentioned this is a cultural impact or possibly a cultural effect. Cultural has significance in this. Did you see then over time through the participation of sports more of a moderation, more of a coming together as the, as the uh, students and the athletes continue to work together? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, yeah, um, we found that in, in, again, it was through the quantitative data aspect of it and um, really need to, and, and we're continuing to dig on it qualitatively to really understand um, that finding. Um, once again, also we want to add more power to it, meaning that um, the individuals that were um, uh, surveyed in that time and the, the um, former abductees that were surveyed um, uh, last year um, that we add more power to it and, and maybe go out and, and, and see whether or not um, more from abductees, we get a larger number of that. Um, uh, first of all, the, you know, it compared uh, non-abductees and find a correlation between non-abductees and, and former abductees in terms of um, peaceful and violent responses. And um, we asked things like um, if, if somebody had harmed you in some way during sport, you know, by accident or, um, for, you know, what would be a, an appropriate reaction. And, um, and, and we brought it down to these um, uh, particular facets of it, like I just mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, a, again, we have to be very careful about that. Um, we have to look at, you know, we want to look at things like um, length of abduction and, and the period of time in which they've been returned. These were all individuals within their communities. So some may have been in communities for several years and have really, you know, uh, really have adapted to the rhythms of community life more so than um, uh, somebody who has maybe just returned, um, you know, a few weeks ago in, in that. So we have to take into consideration those things also. Um, I, I really, you know, really surprisingly, people ask me all the time about, you know, the violence and, so, you know, and, and it really wasn't there. They, they uh, you know, like I said, there was more immediate reactions to things. Um, the, you know, uh, one boy, t uh, I'll tell you very quickly, um, uh, one, one boy we were watching and they were playing and somebody had tackled him. They were playing football and go figure, and, and, um, and soccer, excuse me, I'm in the U.S., and he got tackled hard, and when the boy got up who had tackled him to get the ball, he pushed him down, 
And, you know, I talked to him later and he said, well, professor, I didn't push him down because I was a rebel. I pushed him down because it hurt. <laughs> and and I, I thought that was really, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and then I watched Man U that night and I saw it happen five times. <laughs> so, so, no, I, I mean, and then by no means is it acceptable. And, 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 but again, those teachable moments and stuff and how do we react to those things um, are, are, are very important. And, 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 you know, the role of the coach and the facilitator of these programs is very, very important. And we have to, we also have to bear in mind, you know, how the conflict has affected them. Um, for instance, if you have a child um, who was returned and that child had killed the parents of that coach, or something you can imagine, you know, the animosity that may be there between those two. And and that coach may not, or, or the facilitator of that program may not have the psychosocial readiness to be able to lead that program also. But, um, you know, the violence was, you know, never at, at this large scale level or anything with full blown, I mean, uh, you know, just, just some immediate reactions to things. And, and when addressed, um, you know, we didn't see that really many occurrences after that and so, but uh, you know sometimes just a uh, you know albeit a natural reaction at times to things thanks sure thanks um i think what i will try to do now is take a question from each side um and then see how the, the res respondents here can perhaps uh, integrate um, their replies so if you could lead off thanks um suggest that there's, a, there's an interesting agenda behind uh, the, um, the critiques of, uh, of organizations like the, uh, the Daily Kings or Athens Olympics. Um, I, I'm glad Victor mentioned that uh, China was critiqued for being too ready, too prepared, trying too hard, uh, and then the other side is, uh, is the not being ready enough. in Delhi in, in April, um, talking to some Indian intellectuals who, who suggested that um, they were as critical as anybody about their preparation for, for the Commonwealth Games, but they felt that the international critique had really racist and imperialist uh, overtones to it and, and were, were quite concerned about that. Um, you know, and they felt that there was an agenda associated with that, and certainly Greek people felt, uh, felt similarly course, in the end, the, uh, the Commonwealth Games came off, everything worked fine, um, and talking to some athletes last week who had recently returned from, from the Games, they said that the, the Athletes' Village, which was a subject of a great deal of critique, was a actually had set a new high bar for, uh, for Athletes' Village. They'd never been in one that was uh, that, was that well thought out and, uh, and, and that ready. Um, their only critique was that uh, there was so much security that they didn't get to be much of Delhi. Thanks. So take one from each side. Yeah, so take, we'll take one. From, uh, Dr. Donnelly will introduce himself uh, <laughs> later in the day. <laughs> Ma'am. Um, my name is Sam Moran. I'm a first year student, a master's student at Georgetown, and Professor Chan is actually one of my teachers. Um, but they wake up early at Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> actually looking at ways to integrate from the micro and macro levels, um, where do you see sport as a tool of economic development um, going forward? Because I think you've spoken a lot about political at the macro and a lot about social at the micro, but is, is there a way to connect those two levels and where do you see that going forward? Okay. Um, okay, good questions, both of them. On, on the um, uh, the critique of the preparations for the games. It, 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 when the, the interesting thing when I've looked at this is the, in terms of media coverage of these major events is that you do see a cycle. And that is that in the run up to the events, um, there are two things that are always focused on. Uh, one is the logistics preparation and the other is the environmental impact or, or whether the environment you know is going to be a clean game because a lot of these games as we all know now happen in developing countries developing countries actively bid for this because they see it as part of their economic development and things and and so all of the focus is on this 
And then the organizers, particularly if they're from the third world, inevitably see this as um, uh, journalism with a whiff of racism. Right? Um, and then once the games start, uh, whatever the games are, um, the focus entirely shifts to the athletes and the stories of the games. Um, and I think that this was probably the case in Delhi. It was certainly the case um, in Beijing. And, and for this reason, I think, when, and, and it was the case before the Los Angeles games, uh, questions about logistics, questions about smog, uh, before Barcelona, questions about logistics, questions about smog, Seoul, it was, it was the same. So, um, um, and so undeniably, in advance of the games, the magnifying glass is on how well people are being prepared. And frankly, nobody can meet the bar of being 100% prepared. Even the Chinese were under severe criticism um, uh, for n um, in, the, in advance of the games. Uh, but it is a cycle. Um, it's very much a cycle. The interesting thing in the case of the Beijing Olympics was that there was all this focus on um, um, whether they would be well prepared, um, and then um, questions about whether the air would be clean, uh, all of the um, uh, attempts to, by the Chinese, to put down any efforts at using the games as a forum for political protests by different groups, protesting China's policies in Tibet, their uh, aid policy to Africa, these sorts of things. Um, and then um, the interesting thing was, as you will all remember, on the day of the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, um, I was, uh, I was asked by the Lara News Hour to go on and do commentary for the opening of the games. And I got to the studio and they said, this isn't the lead piece anymore. Right? This is the second piece. The lead piece um, um, has to do with uh, um, 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 uh, the war right, in Russia, right? or Russia's war, basically. And so in many ways, the best thing that could have ever happened for the Chinese was to start the games on the day that you had another major political event because the international news cycle no longer saw the Olympics as the hard news story. Um, they saw the Olympics as the soft news story. And then all the focus went to the athletes while the hard news story was focused on um, uh, the Russians in, in Chechnya. Right? So, um, so much for the Olympic truth. Right, so much for the Olympic truth. Um, um, on sport as a tool of economic development. You know, it's a good question, Sarah. I think um, <clears throat> the it's, very, it's clear, I mean, it's clear in the history of this that, as I said, um, cities, um, states, even countries um, see the Olympics as an opportunity for some big ticket infrastructure, telecommunications, other sorts of major projects that they wanted to do uh, that they want to speed up, right? And you saw this in Barcelona, you saw it in Sydney, you saw it in Utah and other places. Um, whether there is an empirically, empirical link between these games and sustained economic development is an entirely different question. And I don't think there is really a lot of evidence to show that there's sustained economic development that comes out of these games. You get this big surge, usually having to do with a lot of public spending, uh, but then you see a drop off, often a post-Olympic post slump. Um, um, so I don't think we, we have, we have well, I don't know if it's been well researched, but at least I don't think we've seen a real link there. I think more and more you see, um, as I said, developing countries, countries on the cusp that really want to use these games as an opportunity both to project a message to the world but also to spur some sort of economic development. And again, it, 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 it's, it's hard to say whether the latter, the first of those is clearly something that everybody tries to do, some successful, some not. The latter, it's not clear. Um, just real quick about the economic development piece, and that is a great question. Um, I've always thought that you know this whole paradigm of sport for development and peace really did see um, uh, the economic development piece under that auspices of development um, on that macro level. Um, but also one of the one of the findings that uh, we had in uh, in our research also was the development of what I called the economic development subscale. That came out of the uh, that came out of the research a significant subscale, and, um, and 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 what happened there is that the the children and youth felt that they could um, learn workplace values um, through sport, 
and um, uh, they, they, they very much agreed that they could develop leadership skills through sport and, and um, workplace values. And again, those transference of those values and, and, um, and of course, coupled with opportunity um, may be able to provide useful, uh, uh, prove useful as well. Um, but one thing that they didn't really agree on was that sport could improve their employability. And um, that was really interesting, so we wanted to follow up on that piece as well. And that, um, uh, but we, we've done some follow-ups on that, and and um, we really wa do want to make that connection. Um, there, again, if I mention a program, I'm not endorsing the program, but it's just for you to go out and look at it and make, you know, you know, find an, uh, um, uh, information on it, and you make the judge of that. But um, I was introduced to a program that's in, um, I believe it's USAID funded program um, with um, Partners for America here in Washington D.C. called Aganar. And um, it's an economic development program through sport. And um, they're scaling up now. And, and, and they're in um, uh, uh, South America, I believe, in Peru, Ecuador, and Brazil as well. And um, they, they look at that exactly. You know, what can we do? They use sport to develop those workplace values. And then they um, actually have partners within the, um, uh, within the uh, cities or towns or whatever it is. Uh, uh, like a mentorship program and stuff, and they have have children and uh, uh, I'm sorry, youth that are um, within this program. Then um, also have apprenticeships or internships along that lines, and um, I, I found that interesting at that um, uh, uh, you know to touch on that micro level aspect of it as well. Thanks, Eric. Did you want to yeah, make a comment? Um, uh, the UN and especially our office um, uh, really recognize the importance of mega sports events. And um, I'm not an economist, so I don't know how sustainable economic growth <coughs> is after a mega sports event. But we also have to, to see that the direct revenues <coughs> of, of these games are not kept by the host country. It's the organizer, the IOC and FIFA. Um, marketing, um, TV rights, merchandising, ticketing, and so on. So we're trying to, um, to really encourage those organizers and these organizations to invest in their legacy of the games. And uh, the IOC um, um, recently followed the example of FIFA. Uh, FIFA had football for hope centers in, 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 tw in 20 sites in Africa. Now the IOC is also um, kind of um, jumping on that train uh, and has sports for peace centers. So uh, we work more with the international organizations um, so that they invest. For them it's CSR, corporate social responsibility, but for us it's, it's more about using um, the mega sports events to, um, as a communication platform, of course, to, uh, to disseminate UN messages, um, health education, um, reproductive health, HIV AIDS, and so on. But also try to encourage the organizers, um, who have also a commercial interest, of course, uh, to invest more in, in, in social legacy programs. And it's true, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue of the media in general. They w th this will not change the negative reporting wherever games take place, whether in, in developing countries or in developed countries. So in, in uh, South Africa, everybody was surprised that, these, uh, that the football um, World Cup was so perfectly organized. There was no crime. And the media went so far, um, just two weeks before the games, they reported about rats in the Johannesburg Stadium, <laughs> just to, to write something because they, they lacked um, violent stories, you know? So I think it's... Um, um, this uh, we cannot change the media in this respect. No. I mean, they have another agenda. Quite so. Um, thanks. Um, we have approximately a minute and a half for three people to make their comments and our three panelists to make their responses. Uh, I'm sensitive that we don't want to eat into the time for uh, the second uh, panel. So if, if I could ask your indulgence, um, please each of you standing there, uh, make, um, if you could identify yourself, make a brief comment or ask a brief question. We'll see how rapidly we can, we can this is going to be a sprint, <clears throat> not a marathon. My name is Roger Foster. I'm from the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding at Eastern Mennonite University. The question that I have uh, relates to macro and micro. Uh, basically, are those the only arenas available, or is there something in between on a continuum where people can participate meta, mesa level as well? Thank you. Over here. My name is Baron Spielding. I'm a, a managing director of the School for Peace with the uh, Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. My question is um, the role of about the role of trauma. Uh, we talked about reconciliation and reintegration for child soldiers. My question is, uh, is sports in this capacity a form of kinesthetic trauma healing? And if not, um, what role does uh, sports play in, in relieving the trauma, addressing the 
Thank you. Over here. My name is Kate Bogan. I'm at American University. I'm a master's student there. Uh, my question actually <coughs> goes along with both of those really well. Um, I was wondering how can sport be used to reconcile divided societies? Um, so it's not quite at the macro level. It's not quite at the grassroots level. But somewhere in the middle of um, building a national identity um, for societies that are so divided. Okay, thank you as well. Um, we do have exactly zero minutes for, for the three of you. To, uh, the questions uh, referred to, is there some meso level in between the micro and the macro, which we've talked about, uh, sports and uh, healing of trauma, and then reconciling divided societies. And I'm uh, happy to have a turn at bat as long as you take no more than 45 seconds um, to make your swing. I'll, I'll be very brief on the kinesthetic trauma healing question and the role of sport. Um, we, we need to be able to look at that. We need to be able to examine. Um, I, I'd be so short to say that, you know, doing random control trials and, and that medical side of things, um, but we have to understand that there's um, different exposures to violence and, and obviously different traumas that come out of it. So not every child is at, you know, similar levels. Um, not every child participated in violence um, or were victims of violence within conflict. So we have to be able to see where they're at in, in, in that aspect. Um, I'll stop there, and I'll talk to you later. Um, on the, on the uh, divided societies, I think in terms of the question about micro versus um, uh, macro, I think it, looking through the rest of the schedule, you have a lot in between there. So I think that the rest of the day is going to really cover, um, cover things quite well. On the Uniting Divided Societies, just let me, two quick examples. I mean, sport has been used um, to unite divided societies. The two very quick examples would be, um, because they're contrasting ones, the example of Yemen and Korea. And in the case of Yemen, you had the use of football, soccer, um, um, for North and South Yemen to create a united team. Um, and, you know, again, the idea was, when the Yemen, when the when you had the unification of Yemen, you had all these ministries that were being combined and all this other stuff. And for the people, that means nothing, right? When ministries, it's like the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey merging. Who cares? Like you can't. But when the, the when the national football team merges, right? That's a big deal, and everybody that everybody can see that and understand that. And the way the Yemenis decided to do it was they did it. Um, they did it in a very. They did it where they focused entirely on the unity of the country. So um, they had um, um, players sort of uh, from North and, South, um, uh, North and South Yemen. They had assistant coaches from North and South Yemen. They played um, the, the, um, the, the so-called you know, championship match on the one-year anniversary of Yemeni unification. Um, and the head coach, they could not pick North or South, so they picked the Brazilian. Right. Um, the, the converse case of that is the two Koreas, which are still not, they're still divided. And they tried, they fielded a united team to enter the Sydney Olympics together. So they entered as one nation, but they played separately. Then during the Sunshine Policy Days, the engagement policy days of the Kim Dae-jung administration, they tried to play, form a united team. The problem that they faced, of course, was that the South Koreans wanted best athletes on the united team. And the North Koreans said, no, it's 50-50 quota. Right? And you have South Korean world-class athletes that said, you know, no, I mean, my teammate is the second best in the world, and you're saying he can't be on the team because we have to put this North Korean on the team for equality reasons, so it never happened, right? So those are two different cases of, of sport trying to unite divided societies. Thanks. Um, any, okay, I, I uh, appreciate the restraint <laughs> here. Um, we're four minutes into overtime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, there will be, you will have a break. Uh, I, my colleague uh, Kathleen is going to, uh, Kathleen Kinest is going to chair the next one on institutions and organizations mobilizing sports and peace building. We've already talked a bit about that. I'm going to uh, take a chance on her ill will and say, why don't you aim at being back here at 17 minutes after 11 on the dot? <laughs> is that right? No, that's, I'm, I'm giving you too much. How about 14? <laughs> See what we can do. And, <laughs> and uh, could I have one last round of applause for our very good panel? Please?